What's up guys? Welcome to Found Flicks. With Halloween on the horizon, it's the time of the year for getting spooked. And what's better than a haunted house? Especially one that goes horribly wrong. I just love movies set in haunted houses. It's the perfect kind of horror to get into the season. That's why on this Ending Explained, we'll be looking at the found footage modern classic Hell House LLC. The name of a group of friends that work in creating haunted houses. And their latest venture at the potentially haunted Abaddon Hotel will wind up having great consequences as a documentary crew investigates the mysterious horrors that befell them on opening night of their haunt. When it comes to found footage horror flicks, the obvious motivation is that the style lends to having an extremely low budget, thanks to the janky handheld style the format is known for. The idea being to create scares with very little in terms of budget and scale, which is where most found footage movies fall flat. But what makes Hell House LLC so good is just how damn scary it is despite their obviously limited resources. I mean, the movie looks like it costs about 35 bucks. The video quality is grainy, dark, moving around all over the place. It honestly looks like shit. But they actually use their limitations effectively and make one hell of a scary movie and overall fun Halloween treat. So it's got great scares and plenty of suspenseful moments, and additionally crafts well-rounded and believable characters, which makes all of the difference. And a lot of what makes it work so well is their natural chemistry. Another seemingly simple, but actually extremely difficult aspect to get right with these kinds of movies. Hell House also tells its story in an interesting way, unfolding the events through a documentary investigating what happened that fateful night as a mystery that develops over the runtime, before in the end finally seeing for ourselves what happened. Also worth noting, I didn't know that there were multiple versions of this movie, and the one that I got is the extended cut, and these few minutes actually make a huge difference. The other cut that I had seen didn't include some extremely pivotal scenes. There is a lot about the story that could be confusing, but if we pay enough attention to the details spread throughout, it's easy to piece together the bigger picture of what's going on and who is behind it. So let's take a trip to the Halloween haunt at the Abaddon Hotel, courtesy of the Hell House LLC crew, exploring the mysteries of their tale and filling in the blanks of what happened, as well as looking at the quite effective and shocking twist ending that changes all of our preconceived ideas about what we've been seeing. At the opening of the documentary, little is known for certain about what happened on the night of October 8th, 2009. Only that 15 people were killed and even more injured at the Hell House LLC haunted house at the abandoned Abaddon Hotel hotel in upstate New York. The only footage they have of that night is from one group of kids that was uploaded to YouTube. We see they're excited and ready to be scared, stepping into the haunted attraction with many others surrounding them, from their perspective getting the first signs that something might be up, as another girl is seen running past them into a back door and disappears down the hallway, the group writing it off as opening night complications. Yeah, well, that is accurate, but in a way they couldn't possibly imagine. Venturing down the stairs into the always creepy basement, they find they can't go down as a flood of people frantically are attempting to get back up, our group getting caught in the chaos, the mass of terrified people running out for their lives, getting ushered outside by one of the crew, confused but at least still alive, fire engines already on the scene. The particulars of the night are still shrouded in mystery, other than the loss of many lives, with the official report being that there was some kind of malfunction or gas leak. In order to peel back the layers of what happened that night, several years later, investigative reporter Diane and her crew are attempting to uncover the the truth via the documentary that we are watching, speaking to witnesses and other experts on the matter. When speaking with a photographer who managed to sneak into the hotel afterwards, they get their first clue that there was more than some kind of simple malfunction or gas leak that night, and his photos seeing traces of blood all over the place, which already debunks the cover story the public was told. However, the photographer Martin wasn't brave enough to enter the basement, can't really blame him there, noting that he's been to some scary places in his life, but there was no way he was going down there. And as we saw in the earlier tape, the basement is the main location where things first originated. The fates of the Hell House LLC crew since the incident has also been unknown, until one of them, Sarah, who hadn't been heard from since that night, reaches out to Diane to be interviewed. Being able to talk to someone that was there firsthand would prove invaluable to understanding what happened. When asking how she's been coping, a sedate Sarah says she's in a better place now. But when asking deeper questions, she's cagier in her responses, asking about the town's decision to conceal the truth from the public. Sarah calls this smart, as it would be hard to deal with what really happened. Everyone wondering what the heck actually happened. And Sarah has a gift 
that will set the narrative in motion of the events that led to that night, producing a bag full of tapes shot by the Hell House crew, documenting the entire process from the arrival at the Abaddon Hotel all the way through opening night. When we first meet the crew on their way to their latest haunted house creation, it's well established that they are quite close and good friends. As we know, the standard found footage setup usually involves, you know, at least 30 minutes or so of buildup, people babbling at each other until the scares finally start, called Act 2. The case is the same here, but they deserve credit for building a reasonable cast of unknowns to pull off the ensemble, which in addition to Sarah is made up of the leader of the crew and Sarah's boyfriend Alex, who seems to be the one always making decisions on behalf of the group, including selecting the Abaddon as their newest location, way outside of their usual spots in New York City. His other half, in the business sense, is Mac, who deals with the business and logistics side of things, while Alex focuses on the creative. Then there's Tony, kind of a general construction electrician guy, and Paul, who is mostly there to man the camera. And they do at least try to establish, okay, Alex likes to have everything documented, so never stop shooting no matter what. Found footage movies also always have to bake in a reason for these people to be filming all this crap in the first place, and they do at least establish why, so they can study the tapes to improve for their next year's haunt. Fine. Fair enough. Arriving at the Abaddon, it is certainly more than a little run down, having been abandoned for several years. But all the weird and creepy shit around is actually perfect set dressing for the haunted house. Score! Well, that takes care of that. Thanks, Spooky Hotel. Touring the decayed remains of the location, the gang isn't so sure what Alex has gotten them into this time. But he is confident that this is the perfect location for their next house. Sure hope it isn't haunted or anything, as they get their first signs of the evil presence at the location. When in the attic, their walkie is overtaken by a a static warbling noise. It only lasts for a moment, but as they rejoin Alex, we catch a glimpse of a black robe figure in the corner. So yeah, it's already not looking good for these hapless haunted house homies. But sure, they didn't see him. However, down in the basement, they're greeted by another alarming warning sign. This being where the majority of the people are killed on opening night. And guess what's down there? A pentagram and upside down crosses all over the walls, as well as a whole bunch of Bibles littering the ground. Sure clues that Satan is afoot in the bowels of the hotel. A lot of times he is involved with the evil, but Alex is again convinced that this whole satanic ritual setup is brilliant and is bubbling with ideas on how to utilize it as part of the show. Yeah, Alex, nothing to worry about. After some time, tech whiz Tony has got their intricate security camera system with cams all over the hotel set up, but conveniently they can't get one down in the basement and decide on a solution to hide an actor in costume in the basement to monitor things. The paranormal occurrences are of only middling evil as the setup continues, a door opening on its own and someone passing by as they work on hanging a corpse prop. And later, Paul records a stupid confessional in bed, not noticing someone walking into the room, blathering on for a while as they eerily stand there watching. He finally turns to look, asking if it's Sarah, to no response, the person only slowly turning and walking away. Paul casually is like, oh, well that was weird, and somehow not terrified goes right to Betty Buys. <laughs> yeah, right dude, I'd be pissing my pants. When casting other parts with locals, Melissa fills them in with the rumor in town about the history of the Abaddon. The owner supposedly hung himself, and things happen to guests, bluntly stating that it's supposed to be haunted to the shock of everyone else. The owner Tully built the hotel in Abaddon for a specific reason, as this is in some versions of the Bible the demon that guards the gateway to hell. The owner Andrew Tully also had a cult of crazy followers, and considered himself a modern day Dante. And this makes clear what Tully's intention was, to open a portal to hell in the basement of his hotel. Sure, why not? When it came to the missing guest, each time Tully was cleared of all charges, but his reputation was still tainted, and the hotel went under, resulting in him a few months later hanging himself in the dining room. And of course, even amongst all this horrifying exposition dump, Alex is still like, what? That's just a rumor. There's no way this place is haunted. That's ridiculous, Melissa. And it's pretty clear he's known about the true history of the hotel this whole time, and chose to keep the others in the dark. Good friend, thanks for that, buddy. Despite all this, it's still mostly business as usual. Even when Paul comes across a clown from the basement when going through the haunt rooms, but we see it's not Joey in the costume, as he's in the other room. So who was the clown? I don't know, good question. When Paul runs back, he's gone, finding him untouched sitting in his original position 
position down in the basement. Well, that's terrifying, but they convinced themselves it was all just some kind of prank. And the creepy hotel inhabitants seem to favor torturing Paul for some reason, as he has another frightening encounter when testing out the haunts. Amongst the blinking strobe lights, another freak figure appears in the blinks. One more than should actually be there. Uh-oh. Mortified, Paul tries to pound on the door to get out, finding it jammed closed, until it finally opens and he blows chunks all over the kitchen floor. Can't, yeah, whoa, gross. The group are on edge at this point, but Alex is steadfast, wanting them to stay and keep working to make money. And we understand more about his selfish nature in another interview, calling Alex his own worst enemy, more interested in the company that he created than anything else. The others were only loyal to him as good friends. Well, a lot of good that did you guys, worst friend ever, as the evil clown is back to mess with them again. Woken up in the middle of the night, he's found standing there on the stairs. And when Mac bravely goes down to touch him, it's an un moving and plastic mannequin. So the two work to put him back. Along the way, finding Sarah in a daze, facing a wall and speaking backwards. Oh boy, that's not good. But she quickly comes back from her odd state. And in the distraction, the clown guy has disappeared. They go searching for the clown, finding a meal set up for them in the dining room and the clown down there waiting for them as well. Jeez, I cannot take it with this guy. He's freaking me out. The clown jumping around all over the place. Jeez, just stop it. Stop it already. The next morning, searching for Alex leads to them discovering more disconcerting information about his state of mind. In his sketchbook, there are pages full of all kinds of weird satanic stuff, like the clown guy, upside down crosses, you know, standard stuff. Implying that the evil presence of the hotel has started to infect Alex's mind, which does help explain his peculiar behavior. And it's now three days until opening. Paul doesn't seem that excited for some reason, admitting that everyone is a little stressed. But Alex is more confident than ever. Even even though as he tells Sarah, she's not looking so good. I don't know, maybe that could be because she's been living in a haunted hovel for a month, you jerk. And it's not much later that we see that Paul's worries were spot on. Waking up later to a woman sitting on the wall behind him, scaring the hell out of him, he hides under the covers, waiting a few moments before peeking out and her head has turned to face him, then starting to stand up and come towards him. One last peekaboo and she's right in front of him, bellowing no as the camera cuts. Well, damn. Who's gonna run the camera now? And it's Tony who finds it later. No sign of Paul in the room. They try to call him on the phone, only getting a loud shrieking sound. Probably not normal. Distant screams send them down into the basement. And when searching the cold storage fridge, all three clowns' heads turn to face them. <laughs> and Paul is there slumped against the wall. Alex annoyed with him, thinking as usual, this was all some kind of prank. I mean, good Lord, man, get it together. At least at a later group meeting, he relents that something is out of the ordinary, as the clown head mannequin can't actually turn, which we saw that they did. So that's definitely not a good sign. Tony then attempts to quit telling off Alex, but Mac chases him down as he knows something important. Although the tape conveniently skips right over whatever the dark secret he shares to convince Tony to stay, keeping this a mystery until the sequel. Ever since being rescued from the basement, Josh has been pretty much catatonic and hasn't said a word. Oh well, time for the big opening night. And there's already a pretty sizable lineup outside. Hmm, maybe it was worth all this ghost torture for a taste of success. Matt goes outside to let the crowd in, seeing the same group's footage from the earlier YouTube video, looping back to that time shown at the beginning, but filling in the full story of what had previously been unknown. Things go off the rail even more quickly than we might have anticipated when their planted security clown Joey is seen running out of the basement, hearing blood-curdling screams right outside. Sarah rushes upstairs to find out what's going on, connecting to the girl running through the door at the beginning. It was Sarah. Then getting to see for ourselves what happened moments earlier. We see a skull-faced hell guy in the corner and Joey is quick to split. Thanks, thanks for the help, Joey. Wasn't your whole point down here to keep things secure? Leaving Melissa stuck in chains, screaming to be let out. The scene erupting into total chaos as the crowd scatters in a panic and a flaming hole opens up in the ground. Melissa getting dragged inside. Oh, so I guess Tully did get his portal to hell figured out. Good for him. Running through the rooms, they're led outside by Mac, as also seen earlier, but unluckily for him, the door seals closed with him still inside. He pounds on it to no avail, guiding the others to another way out. He then sends Tony down to the basement for help, seeing all of the haunts in the house have come to life and are hungry for souls. And Tony is the next to get taken, hearing screams as he goes through a door. Sarah flees back up more stairs to the attic, finding Alex in the middle of hanging himself. She tries to get him down as loud whooshing noises ring out, and she turns to a group of black robed figures and their leader, the camera dropping to the ground 
ground and fading away. Seems like quite an abrupt ending, but back with Sarah now, she says that that was all that happened. She came downstairs from the attic, making it to the front door with no incident just as the police arrived. Seems maybe a little odd that nothing at all happened in the literal house of horrors and with the robed hell dudes surrounding her and everything. Sounds really plausible. Great job, Sarah. She says now that she wants to take a break, asking to continue the interview later at her room to see, encouraging Diane to pay the hotel a visit. When she confusingly responds that it's all boarded up, Sarah asks, is that all that's stopping you? Obviously trying to lure her into going there for herself, which they do immediately decide to go do. Mitchell staying behind to check out more of the footage. He made a smart choice, as this documentary is actually edited by his character. And since he didn't go with Diane, he didn't die, as she is naturally going to. They check for Sarah at the front desk, but it turns out they don't have a 2C at their hotel. And no guest with her name either. Strange! Realizing she must have met at the Abaddon, Diane heads to the hotel. Mitchell, viewing the footage, learns that they have made a horrible mistake watching the rest of what really went down after Sarah collapsed in the attic. She grabs the camera, navigating the labyrinth halls of the hotel. Another hooded guy glimpses watching her. She then comes across an odd looking Paul, relieved just to see him, and goes to hug him. He then picks up the camera and proceeds to bash it into Sarah's head over and over until the camera stops working. Still alive, a bloodied Sarah gasps on the floor. Paul stepping to her side and stands there, hearing an ominous growling demonic voice getting closer, and she's quickly dragged off screen. Paul still standing there, we see blood start to pour down the wall. Him coming into frame coughing, slashed throat, and bloody knife in hand. The police outside her knocking aggressively on the door. So Sarah was obviously killed, and thusly the person they've been interviewing is actually a ghost. As is often the case with haunted locations in movies, the location intends to lure more people into its walls to claim their souls, which we saw come to fruition on opening night, waiting and bringing in as many people all at once to slay them all. The same for Sarah, who did plant the idea into Diane's head to go to the hotel herself. Inside the building is now dark as shit. Blood stains and stuff still lining the walls where Sarah was taken away. Running into a barricade of stuff, they have to find a way around, seeing what looks like ghost Alex standing nearby, but they never notice as usual. Cresting the basement stairs, the cameraman is afraid to go any further, as Diane gets a call from Mitchell, which she declines. Shouldn't have done that, lady, as he obviously had important information for her. They instead head upstairs, and there find room 2C, where Sarah said she was staying. Inside, Sarah is facing away, sitting on the bed. Turning back, seeing her face is all messed up, and the door slams closed. Robe dudes appearing and flanking around her, attacking the duo. The tape momentarily statics, and everyone is gone. The room now completely empty. So in the end, everybody is checking into the Abaddon. And once you check in, you don't check out, because that Tully guy has your soul now, and you're trapped here forever. What a bummer. To me, Hell House on its own works extremely well in the tired found footage style and really creates something unique and full of great scares. However, this was always conceived as a trilogy, and that means that there is a lot more to look at in the Hell House series. Next up being the sequel, Hell House 2, The Abaddon Hotel, that digs even further into the evil hotel and maybe digs a little too deep kind of removing any mysterious aspects that were pretty obvious from this one. But that's for another video. So check back soon for my look at Hell House 2 coming your way. Stay tuned, unless I run into more copyright shit like I did with The Descent. What did you guys think of Hell House LLC and its ending? What are your favorite found footage horror movies? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.